Hi, it's Dave. So the year is 2001, and the September 11th attacks were just a few months before this. I found myself in Pakistan around Christmas time, and I was looking for Afghan street kids who were making a living picking up garbage on the streets of Peshawar. It broke my heart that tens of thousands of Afghan refugee kids were wandering the streets of Pakistan as so-called garbage kids. I didn't know what to do, but I knew I wanted to do something. And I had an on-the-ground contact who lived in the area who I'd never met before. And together, we would actually pack his car um, with Christmas gifts. And every day during this time, we would drive um, through the streets. And when we'd spot some Afghan street kids picking up garbage, we'd pull over, give them some gifts, and chat with them, basically listening to their story. After a couple weeks in Pakistan, I was slated to go back to the States. My contact um, there and I, we had kind of become this known thing among the street kids there. We had this red car, which is in my contact's car. And whenever the kids saw our car, they would yell, Christmas car, Christmas car, and chase after our car because they knew that we had some gifts and we would hang out with them. Anyways, after preparing to leave Pakistan, I met some NGO workers who were coming out of Afghanistan and passing through Pakistan. They had told me that they, they had taken the UN flight out of Kabul. And I was curious and I asked them if there were any people going into Kabul. And I was surprised to find that actually some people were going into Kabul. Now this was the end of 2001 and the US had just launched an invasion right into Afghanistan weeks ago. The US invasion was actually very swift and the government and the Taliban there had fallen uh, really quickly. And I'd wanted to actually to go into Afghanistan, but I, I didn't think there was a way. It was just like, you know, a crazy war zone, I thought. And I was surprised to hear that there was actually a regular UN flight going in and out of right, the country. So I did what any normal sane person would do. I ditched my flight back to the US and I instead went to the UN office and booked a flight into Kabul the next day. I was surprised at how easy it was. Um, it helped actually that I had started previously a, a small nonprofit organization. And so when I was applying for the ticket, et cetera, I was able to state my organization name and actually provide proof, right, of my organization. But other than that, there were no visas required and it was just a payment for the flight. I think it was like 1200 US dollars or so. And just like that, I was on board a charter UN flight with um, two couple with several other foreigners on board. And that kind of led into this uh, saga, right, of where I was introduced to a rather small and loose network of foreign reporters and NGO, work, NGO workers in Kabul and, and in Afghanistan. And I spent a couple of weeks there um, in Kabul and the surrounding areas. And I would hit the streets daily, talking with as many people as possible using a translator. And I asked what they thought about the Taliban, what they thought about the US, right, their future, um, their concerns. And what I heard on the streets was a much more complicated story than the overly simplified narratives in media. And the reality on the ground, it was just way more complex. I was able to visit orphanages and some other of the rougher parts of town. And I was able to just hang out with a lot of people there. The children there were just absolutely adorable. The people there were generally warm and um, with strong personalities. And a couple of years after this, I found myself in Iraq. The year was 2003, and the U.S. had recently invaded Iraq, and the government fell quickly in that country as well. It was strange times. I went uh, from Jordan um, across the border to Iraq, and again, there was no visa required. Part of it is because there was no government in Iraq, right? Um, who would process a visa with no government? I ended up taking a very, very long ride um, uh, across the border um, into Baghdad, I remember stopping by um, at a restaurant um, with a million flies, and that's time for another story. But anyways, what I found in Baghdad was a complex story. Again, it was much more complicated and nuanced than what the Western media was portraying. The Western media was saying that hey, this is the liber liber liberation right, of Iraqis, and everyone is happy, and we saw the video clips on media. But inside the country, talking with people on the streets of Baghdad, actually just hanging out, it was obvious that things were much more nuanced and complicated than that. And in fact, many of the people I talked with actually respected Saddam. They might not have liked him completely, but they respected them, respected him. And it was a complex set of values and 
kind of worldview um, and perspectives that people had there. And overall, people were actually very suspicious of the U.S. And I think a lot of the reasons are a good part of the reason why things often are so complicated um, when we compare situations in other countries is because the values and ideologies that make up different societies are so different. And oftentimes we're able to project our own values, right, um, onto others or our own countries, our own society values onto others. And we assume that they value the same things that we do. And if they don't value the same things, then we become judgmental, right, thinking that they're valuing um, less values or less worthy values in us. Anyways, the following year, I took my first trip into North Korea. I don't think anyone can prepare a person fully for the reality of North Korea. It's completely unlike I've, anything I've ever seen or experienced. But I really got to understand and experience the country. I'd spent years studying the country of North Korea and its ideology. I'd literally read tens of thousands of pages um, on their Juche ideology, trying to understand exactly where they're coming from. And something eventually clicked. It was like a light went on in my head, kind of a moment of ag agonoresis where I understood like what made the country tick, right? And it was completely different than what all the journalists and most all the academics were saying. There was this earnest ideology that's blended spirituality, religion, philosophy, nationalism, psych psychology, and more. And while I disagreed with it, and I thought the end results, right, the impact on people and their freedoms, et cetera, and human rights was devastating, I started, though, to see how this ideology was actually powering the fabric of society in that country and how most of the world was discounting the very strength of the ideology that actually brought things together. Being in countries like Afghanistan, Iraq, and North Korea, um, I was able to pick up right their ideologies and these invisible forces at work, and it completely blew my mind. This stuff isn't talked about in media or books very much. The most academics are too far removed from the realities right, of what's really going on. In media, they're oftentimes observing from a distance. Politicians are even worse. There's not much effort most of the time to really find out what's going on. In my opinion, we need better foreign policy, whatever that foreign policy is, that is rooted with understanding. And my question is, where are the next generation of leaders who are sitting on the streets, right, listening to the people of other countries? Right? And I think that type of just empathy slash ability to go beyond one's own ideology and understanding, to understand and to actually empathize with another country or people from different walks of life is essential. Sometime around 2005 or 2006, I ended up visiting Iran, and it was completely different than I expected. There were such warm people there, but again, such strong ideology. And again, such a complicated situation. You have so many different geographies right, within Iran with different ideologies. In fact, you can even take the city of Tehran, and you, Tehran, and you have different right, parts of the city that have different ideologies or right, different cultures. Fascinating place. I ended up visiting some of the holy cities in Iran and seeing the depth of devotion and religious fervor that the people have there. It took my understanding right, of the country to a completely different level. Now, I'm not sure exactly why I'm sharing all of this, but I think one of my main points is I think there's a power of ideology that oftentimes we're overlooking. We try to oversimplify, right, overgeneralize different situations, try to pretend that we know the answer, right? But a lot of times it's based from our bias, from what we think is right and from our, from our ideologies. Some people um, with the Afghanistan um, are thinking that the Taliban might be a, a peaceful government. Right now they're posturing, right? General amnesty and trying to protect certain women's rights. Um, however, in my opinion, it's rather obvious when you look at the ideology. Look into exactly what makes the Taliban tick, why they fought so hard for two decades. It's not actually the minimized, overgeneralized, oversimplified interpretation of what most media or Western even academics think it is. It's much more nuanced. It's much more foundational. And it goes into a lot of religious, um, re religion, spirituality, philosophy, human behavior, psychology. It goes very, very deep into the fabric, I think, of human behavior. In my opinion, it appears that things in Afghanistan are going to get ugly, much more ugly than we've ever seen. 
and now is an opportunity for people to leave. However, the problem is most people can't leave. They have no passports, right? They have no visas. They have no connections. And I think what's going on right now is actually bigger than what, what most people realize. I wouldn't be surprised to see the Taliban in Afghanistan rule for the next 50 to 100 years. And those who are not able to escape right now will have generations born and raised in this country um, with little freedom there. Um, just this morning, I was uh, talking to my dad, who's 80 years old, and he told me when he was four or five years old, his family escaped from communist North Korea just after World War II. And I can't believe I just found out about this today. It was kind of crazy. Um, um, I always had thought my dad had grew up in Seoul or South Korea, but um, yeah, hearing that you know he actually grew up and his family was from North Korea, uh, just above the border um, there, and it got me to think. Imagine if you know my dad's family had been stuck in North Korea, then I actually could have been born in North Korea, and what would my life be like? Obviously, there would be no Dave Lee on Investing Channel for sure. But that's just one thing. It would seem like almost my whole universe, my whole world would be so different. And also the people I interact with, right? And the people um, I yeah, have a relationship like with you right now. Anyways, it makes me think that sometimes one decision by one family member, right? At the right time in history can make a huge difference. For example, with my dad's family, it was probably one family member who had that conviction. Let's go. Right? Now is the time not to stay here. For them to move out of North Korea into South Korea, that changed literally the lives of generations, right? Including myself, my kids, my siblings, etc. And perhaps even the hundreds of thousands of people that you know are impacted by my channel or my videos as well. Anyways, hope this has give, given some food for thought. Um, yeah, it's... Um, different, um, a challenging time, I think, we live in that requires um, not just an acceptance and a blind acceptance of what we're to told to believe and to think by media, by so-called academics or people, people out there, but it requires kind of um, a healthy skepticism to really go beneath the, the surface of things, to really get to the essence, right, um, of things. And I hope that um, my hope is that my channel can be kind of a seed and be used to create kind of or to foster a new generation of people who will have empathy, who will broaden their scope and actually question some of these things and build a better world for the future. Anyways, uh, go ahead and subscribe if you haven't. All my videos can be found as an audio podcast. Just search for Dave Lee on investing in my in your favorite podcast player. I'm also active on Twitter. Just search for Hey Dave Seven um, there, and we'll see you guys in my next video. Thanks.